It seems like politicians know an awful lot about potential strikes here on U.S. soil, whether it's Lindsey Graham talking about how nukes could potentially go off in South Carolina. So you go from guys like Lindsey Graham talking about this to Obama, and he said that his biggest concern is that a nuke could go off in New York City. And it's not just nuke concerns. We have Senator Feinstein coming out and saying that there will be plots to kill Americans. So this is where I think we need to build our intelligence to see that we can disrupt a plot in this country before it happens, because there will be plots to kill Americans. One of the things I worried about 12 years ago and that I worry about today is that there will be another 9-11 attack and that the next time it'll be with weapons far deadlier than airline tickets and box cutters. The imminent collapse of our country, even going so far as posting job offers for commanders who will be trained to seize guns, and I quote, from the civilian population. Oh man, we've been warning you about this for a long time. We've shown you the official documents. The following video details the contents of a Department of Defense document entitled Internment and Resettlement Operations, also known as FM 3-39.40. The document is 325 pages long and it is signed by Joyce E. Morrow, Administrative Assistant to the Secretary of the Army. It was created in 2010, however, it's just been recently leaked to the public via the internet and can now be downloaded from multiple sources. In the description below, you'll find a download link for the document. I strongly encourage you to download it yourself and to verify everything that's being said here. The document outlines military procedures for internment and resettlement of civilians. Included in the list of organizations which may be involved in these internment operations are the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the Department of Defense, and the United Nations. On page 260, it shows the basic layout for a facility focusing on detainment. It is depicted with interrogation areas, tribunal areas, and mortuaries. Each detainment facility is designed to hold 4,000 prisoners, and they are depicted with multiple levels of barbed wire separating compartments within the facilities, with a double barbed wire fence enclosing them, and watched over by 24 guard towers. On page 261, the document depicts the layout for what they call civilian resettlement facilities, which are designed to house 8,000 people. Though it uses the word resettlement, the plans show multiple levels of barbed wire dividing the sections of the facility, with double barbed wire fencing on the outside, as well as 16 guard towers. On page 262, the layout for facilities designed for what they call non-compliant prisoners is shown. These camps are designed to hold up to 300 prisoners, they have three interrogation centers, and are guarded by 13 guard towers. Now, if there's any question whether these plans are active or just theoretical, this should be settled by the fact that the U.S. Army has been running ads for job positions in these camps since 2009, and apparently, they're still hiring. Once again, if you look in the description, you'll find all the links you need to verify this information. It's important to note here that this document was created in 2010, which was under the Obama administration. At page 238, it gives the conditions for the use of deadly force in such camps. Among the justifications for lethal force, it includes to terminate an active escape attempt. That point right there should make it clear that these camps are not benevolent disaster relief type facilities. In FEMA's uh, authorized equipment list, there's actually uh, written descriptions for how the equipment should be used, and it says it's specifically not supposed to be used for riot suppression. Mr. Kamoy, uh, is that true, that it's not supposed to be used for riot suppression? And how do you plan on policing that, since the images show us clearly uh, large pieces of equipment that were bought with your grants being used in that riot suppression? Uh, Senator Paul, that or is... protest suppression, rather. That is accurate. Uh, the categories of personal protective equipment that include helmets, uh, ear and eye protection, uh, ballistics, personal protective equipment, uh, is a prohibition in the authorized equipment list that is not uh, to be used for uh, riot suppression. And what will you do about it? Uh, we're going to uh, follow the lead of the Department of Justice's investigation uh, about the facts. Uh, we're going to work with the state of Missouri to determine what pieces of equipment uh, were uh, grant funded. Uh, and then uh, we have a range of remedies available to us uh, should there be any finding of uh, non-compliance with those requirements. Uh, those include everything from corrective action plans to ensure it doesn't happen again, uh, recoupment of funds. Uh, so we'll look very closely at the facts, um, but we're going to allow the investigation to run its course uh, and uh, determine what the appropriate remedy is. 
But it gets back to the whole question. If you're a police force anywhere in the country from Dundee, Michigan of 3,900, which is an MRAP, to 25 other cities under 25,000 that have MRAPs, they think these are for riot suppression. I don't even know what they think they're for in a city of 3,900 people. But many of the police forces actually think that this is what the equipment would be good for, is riot suppression in a big city in an urban area. And you're specifically instructed that it's not for that. And we've talked about, you know, we've had maybe two instances of terrorism. We spent billions and billions of dollars and maybe two instances of terrorism. So I think really by supplying all of this uh, free equipment, much of which is just frankly inappropriate and really shouldn't be on anybody's list of authorized equipment. Uh, Mr. Estevez, in the NPR investigation of the 1033 program, they list that 12,000 bayonets have been given out. Um, what purpose are bayonets uh, being given out for? Senator, uh, bayonets are available under the program. I can't answer what a local police force would need a bayonet. I can for. give you an answer, none. Okay. So uh, what's, the, what's President Obama's administration's position on handing out bayonets to the police force? It's on your list. You guys create the list. You're going to take it off the list. We're going to keep doing it. We are going to look at what we are providing under the administration's review of all these programs. So it's unclear at this point whether President Obama approves of 12,000 bayonets being given out. I would think you can make that decision last week. I think we need to review all the equipment that we're providing, Senator. And as I said, we, the Department of Defense, do not push any of this equipment on any police force. The states decide what they need. My understanding is that you have the ability to decide what equipment is given out and what equipment is not given out. If you decided tomorrow, if President Obama decided tomorrow that mine-resistant ambush protection 20-ton vehicles are not appropriate for cities in the United States, he could decide tomorrow to take it off the list. You could decide this tomorrow. My question is, what is the administration's opinion on giving out mine-resistant ambush protection 20-ton vehicles to towns across America? Are you for it or against it? Obviously, we do it, Senator. We're going to look at that. I will also say that we can, I can give you anecdotes for mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles of protected police forces in shootouts. But we've already been told they're only supposed to be used for terrorism, right? Isn't that what the rule is? Something that the, the militarization of police is something that has gotten so far out of control, and we've allowed it to descend along with uh, not a great protection of our civil liberties as well. And it needs to be peaceful. There needs to be repercussions for people who do not act in a peaceful way.